have a return visit from Pat Del Giorno, who lives on the North Fork of Long Island. We're glad she's she is a, a Long Island resident. Um, her last talk, I think maybe some of you were here for, was about women's secret agents. It was really interesting. Um, now, why would Pat, who was a former hospital executive, uh, get on the trail of this World War II stuff? We we are we don't know the answer to that, but we are delighted that she uh, has found this new in area of interest and I have to say expertise. Uh, she's a former hospital executive who has consulted on health healthcare regulatory healthcare regulatory issues both nationally and internationally. And after her, her retirement from healthcare, she got a master's degree in English literature with a focus on women's studies, followed by an independent study of women's roles in World War II. She has participated in World War II studies at Cambridge and Oxford Universities and has taught courses on women secret agents, Rosie the Riveter, women aviators, and today, nurses in World War II. Please welcome Patricia Telsurino. Thank you for the very nice introduction, Jenny. And thank you all for coming. And I recognize a few a few faces from my last uh, time here at the Secret Agent, so hello again. Uh, and as Penny said, today we're going to talk about U.S. military nurses and World War II. They served in both the European and the Pacific theaters during the war. And our program today includes slides and a number of film clips. The clips are interviews with some of these nurses much, much later in life. And they talk about their experiences at frontline hospitals. I find these stories very compelling, especially because so much of women's history is either buried or forgotten. So, on December 7th, the day of the attack on Pearl Harbor, there were only 1,000 nurses serving in the U.S. Army Air Force. To, to address that shortfall, the government launched an intensive recruitment initiative. Their goal was to enlist 50,000 nurses, and by 1945, almost 70,000 had served, 59,000 in the Army and 11,000 in the Navy. Uh, the government's campaign used ads, they used films, radio programs and recruitment posters to persuade nurses to join up. Before we go on, can everybody hear me? Yeah, okay. Here's a couple of the posters that they used. They appealed to the nurses' patriotism. We need you. They're needed right now. They appealed to their professionalism. And at the same time, they were offering the opportunity for advancement. The nurses were given commissions when they enlisted in the service. They came in as second lieutenants, and they had the opportunity for advancement from that rank. And they were offered better pay and government benefits. Over 30,000 nurses volunteered for frontline service, at, at, for service at frontline hospitals, and that meant that they were serving under fire. They worked in hospital ships and flying ambulances, hospital trains, clearing stations, field and evacuation hospitals. Wherever a wounded American soldier, sailor, or Marine needed their care, they were there. The nurses worked closer to the front lines than they ever had before. They were an essential part of the chain of evacuation that led to an extremely low post-surgical, uh, post-injury mortality rate for the case. Besides their medical and their nursing ex expertise, they provided comfort and companionship to thousands of battle fatigue soldiers throughout the war. Okay, here we see nurses disembarking from a landing barge onto a beach in North Africa. And this is a tent field hospital 
with zeta tens, and uh, these tens were, they were mobile, and they could be constructed and deconstructed and moved to follow the fi fighting, and that's what they did, they followed the fighting. The nurses became expert at setting them up and taking them down and packing up all the supplies necessary to move on. And despite the red cross that's uh, painted on the tent top, very often they were bombed or strafed, and we'll be talking more about that later in the presentation. Now here we have a couple few gals sitting around on a truck, and obviously they weren't under fire, uh, having a little social. In the field, this was a Life magazine cover, and we see a couple of nurses mucking through the mud from the latrine. <laughs> In the picture on the right, again, we see nurses traipsing through the mud. Mud was a constant in the lives of nurses at many locations. And here, a helmet has many nurses, for many uses. <laughs> These two gals are using a helmet as a shampoo sink at a field hospital in France. They also use them to wash their clothes and sometimes, in a pinch, to cook. One day, when the nurse was using her helmet to bathe, the Germans then began bombarding. And when the firing got close, she dumped out the water in her helmet, slapped it on her head, and she sat there naked until the firing stopped. <laughs> I don't have a picture of that. I don't know if that's good or bad. OK, this is a flight nurse. Uh, these patients are being evacuated by air. They call these nurses winged angels. An evacuation uh, <coughs> could be loaded and airborne within 10 minutes. Usually one nurse and one medical foreman were assigned to a flight. A doctor briefed the nurse on each patient's medical condition prior to taking off. And during the flight, she was responsible for the safety and comfort of up to 25 patients. And that could be very difficult. They were very, very serious wounds. And many, many men, many troops at that time had no clone before. And they would get panicky. Sometimes they had to restrain patients. It was a very a difficult uh, service. Also, the flight nurses assumed much greater risks than their counterparts because the C-47 uh, and the C-46 and the C-54 uh, used in patient occupations, they doubled as cargo planes. So they couldn't display the Red Cross on the exterior of the plane, and that made them fair game for enemy planes. Uh, and they were also subject to the dangers of flying in bad weather. This is a photograph of troops at Anzio Beach, Italy. In January 1944, 70,000 American and British troops stormed ashore far behind German airlines, German lines at Anzio. <coughs> this was a small fishing port on the west coast of Italy. The Allied plan called for a rapid buildup of supplies and equipment on the Anzio beachhead. And then they would make a lightning thrust for 30 miles north to capture Rome. That was the prize. But within 72 hours, the German commander surrounded the bridgehead with scores of tanks and first-rate troops. Some 230,000 army nurses were trapped with the fighting men on a narrow strip of flatland, 18 miles long and about four to seven miles deep. And behind them was the, was the ocean. So they were trapped there for three long and very harrowing months. The Allied territory was so crowded that the hospital had to be located next to some prime German targets, like supply depots and ammunition dumps. And as a result, shells and bombs were constantly crashing around and onto the tent hospital. The medical teams, they worked throughout the bombings, the strafing, and the artillery bombardments. The soldiers would rather, it was so bad that the soldiers would rather have stayed 
in their frontline positions where they at least had foxholes for protection. Then retreated at the beachfront hospital, it was totally exposed and under constant fire. Anzio Beach earned the name A Half Acre of Hell. And I brought some books with me. And this is a book written about Anzio called A Half Acre of Hell. If anybody wants to look at some of these books after I finish, you're more than welcome. They wore their, hat, their helmets and combat boots. The nurses would often be on duty for as long as 36 hours without food or sleep, under continuous bombardment. At night, German planes flew low over the shore, and they dropped flares, and then they unloaded their bombs. During these bombardments, the nurses refused to abandon their patients and seek cover. After being trapped for three months, the Allies finally broke out and headed north and they captured Rome. But thousands of American and British troops had been killed or wounded during the siege. And the nurses also paid a heavy price. Bombs and shells killed six nurses and wounded 16 others. Four nurses were awarded silver stars for valor. This is Lieutenant Elsie Perch. She was a nurse at Angio Beach. And again, this is a much older lady recollecting her memories of her time at Angio in the film clip I'm going to show you. My name is Elsie Perch. Yes. Perch. Sorry. Can we turn um, the sound up? Here we go. Here we go. I, I went in the December the 7th, 1942. And I uh, was in the Army until uh, July of 45. I was a, a registered nurse. Of course, uh, my rank at that time was second lieutenant. And later, I think I I started out with the 105th Station Hospital, and after we had crossed North Africa, I received orders to join the 33rd Field Hospital on Anzio. Uh, this was about a month after it had been first established. And, well, we were a front without a back. <laughs> it, Anzio Beach had was about uh, 18 miles along the coast. It was uh, possibly seven to nine miles deep. We were surrounded by the Germans, except on the Mediterranean side, because we were under fire, air raids, shells, and so forth most of the time. And prior to the time that we got there, six nurses had been killed. One of that hospital had been destroyed. The uh, most difficult patients we had was after uh, the front moved out from Anzio. And at that time, I was with the second platoon of the 33rd field, and we were following the front line. And we had, as I remember, I said I had about 250 patients back at Anzio. When we were following the front line, we were limited to just 30 patients. And they were very ill. Uh, at one time, we, out of our 30 patients, we lost six one day in one day. And I was very depressed about that. And uh, the commanding officer said, well, if we were here, not one of he felt like everybody was under the same circumstances that we were, and he did think. I think, uh, I felt that my husband felt that we were closer to those people than any other woman in our life, because we shared the same experiences. This is 
a letter from the superintendent of nurses to the mother of a nurse who was killed at Anzio. She typifies the very finest in American womanhood. Had she known it was to be thus, she would still have said, I must go. It is my duty. The nurses are like that in this war. They fear nothing. They beg to go forward as far as possible because they feel they are needed so very urgently. Okay, we're going to move on to the nurses of the Tan and Corregidor. They were the first large group of American women in combat and the first group of military women taken captive and imprisoned by an enemy. The film you're about to see tells their story, and it is one of courage under fire, sacrifice, and amazing strength. This is a little bit long, it's about 20 minutes, but it tells their story. Across the international dateline, 
the sounds of Japanese aircraft were heard overhead. The naval hospital on Guam was hit. While in the Philippines, Baguio, Camp John A, <coughs> Fort Stossenburg, Park Field, Del Carmen Field, Nichols Field, <coughs> Beatty, and Corridor were also struck, and Manila too was bombed. <coughs> that we heard this roaring over the, our heads, and we ran to the door, I called it, we could see that the Japanese pilots actually identified them as being Japanese. And they flew right over, and they started dropping bombs around everywhere. We evidently lived a charmed life because the bombs fell all around the hospital, but not on it. The plane uh, fired there low, <coughs> and when the corpsman came through, as uh, the plane passed, and he stopped, and from right in front of my foot, he picked up the shell case. A millimeter difference in the trajectory, and that would have been the end for me. I would never come back to Guam. It was that close. The five Navy nurses on Guam were captured on December 10th and imprisoned in Japan until the repatriation the following August. Meanwhile, patients and hundreds of new casualties poured into Manila on crowded trains, in ambulances, trucks, and buses. <coughs> and I remember uh, looking out after the bombing and seeing Manila on fire. It was all around us. And I could hear the patients screaming for help. And you wanted to help everyone, but there were only two nurses that were in the ward. And it was a ward that held 78 patients, but they were two and three in a bed. They were sitting on chairs. They were lying on the floor. They were holding on their arms or their legs, or they were trying to control the bleeding. And we received orders from our chief nurse. Whatever patients we thought should go to surgery, line them up. And they were operating on the steps the doctors never changed gowns, and in fact, I went up to the operating room one time to check out, and they were just standing in blood. It was all over the place. From December 8th until after Christmas, daylight air raids continued without pause, while on Luzon, enemy forces swarmed ashore. In two weeks, the Japanese changed this peaceful world into one of confusion, destruction, and death. Medical supplies were shipped to Bataan to support what Generals MacArthur and Wainwright saw as a holding force, a defensive line to be held until a convoy of ships could bring more men, weapons, and supplies from home. <clears throat> Army nurses were ordered to evacuate Manila on December 23rd. The commanding officer told us we would be going to the field tomorrow to Bataan. And this was probably the first time any of us ever heard the word of Bataan. On Christmas Eve morning, we were loaded into buses and trucks in our white crisp uniforms and transported to uh, the peninsula of Bataan. The next day, Navy nurses moved with their patients to Santa Scholastica, just outside of Manila, and were captured a few days later. One thing I remember was looking out over the balcony and seeing the American flag come down and the rising sun going up. On Christmas Day, Hospital No. 1 went into operation at Lamai on the southeast coast of Bataan. Between then and January 25th, major surgery was performed on more than 1,200 battle casualties. When Hospital No. 1 at Lamai began to get crowded and casualties continued to come in, it was decided to set up a hospital further down the peninsula. This was designated as Field Hospital No. 2. And as I understand it, they took bulldozers into the jungle and just um, bulldozed out in paths and cots and beds or whatever was available were set up, were set up along these jungle paths. So we started uh, to evacuate patients to that area from number one. And each morning, the ward officer and the nurse in charge would go around and decide which patients could be evacuated. And at this point, uh, we were getting so, we were receiving so many casualties and doing so much surgery that oftentimes a patient that had had surgery the day before had to be moved the next day. 
that these uh, people were put on canvas litters and loaded into buses and trucks and whatever and sent down to field hospital number two. But the girls lived in these buses and they bathed in the stream. And I remember when the new station came in, all we did was secure a little piece of the well and the jungle and toss a blanket over there. That's ground. right, that's all you could do. We talked about it. all you could do was give them a little food and a little medicine. There's one thing that stands out in my memory that makes me feel very badly. When I was making my rounds through the wards, since I had to do it every day, there was one man calling for a drink of water, and I didn't give it to him. And now I wish I had, because poor fellow, yeah. with not him any harm. Meanwhile, the mine was bombed and hospital number one evacuated to a new site closer to Marbelas. It's cots set up on the hilltop site of an abandoned motor pool. There were two wooden buildings. One. Uh, was turned over and used as the uh, operating uh, rooms. Uh, the other wooden building was occupied by us nurses as quarters. But the patients themselves, the casualties themselves, were literally out in the open with only the cover of the uh, Ovea jungle growth. On April 7, 1942, hospital number one was bombed. Patients were killed and two nurses were injured. Then the order came to evacuate to Corregidor the following day. The sad part, being there that night, was I think our soldiers, all our men had been told to retreat, and they came by, and they all stopped and said, do you have any food? Everyone was hungry, and we didn't have any food to give them. We were hungry, too. The night that we were supposed to leave the uh, baton, the commanding officer called me down, and he said, Get your nurses all down here at a certain time and tell them not to bring anything but what they carry in their own two hands. And uh, I said, what about my little Filipina nurses? They're not going, he said. And I said, well, then I'm not going either because they called me Mama Josie and I'm not going to bring them here. So he got word from headquarters and he called me and said, they're going, get them down here. The boats carrying the Army nurses crossed the narrow bay to the island fortress while dodging Japanese aircraft. They arrived to find Corregidor, already under siege. If you ever want to know what the darkness of Egypt was like, you would find out in the Malata Tunnel when the bombing would occur and the uh, generators would go off. It would be so dark that you could feel it. It was all a very gory mess. What was almost worse were the uh, Navy personnel that would get shot up, you know, uh, in the water covered with oil slick and trying to swim through uh, fire, you know, the, uh, the, the oil and the gasoline being <clears> off, <throat> and they would come in as black as, as uh, could be and trying to clean them up enough to do whatever surgically had to be done was a terrible chore. Surgical teams worked at times by lantern or flashlight as the bombing shook the rock fortress for 26 days and nights and the battle for Corregidor continued. More patients arrived to find already overcrowded boards spilling out into the main tunnel. When I knew that surrender was coming, uh, I felt very shaky. And uh, I was glad that we had the work to do. It. Not that I wanted anybody to be wounded, but it kept my thoughts on what I, something besides what was happening outside. So when, when General Cobb and his family were taken off Corregidor, I think this was the first time that I realized that uh, the writing on the wall that uh, we would eventually have to surrender. We were on duty in the Melinda Town Hospital when uh, Corregidor was, was surrendered. We did not see the flag being lowered. <coughs> Frank Wally came to my board about an hour before the surrender, and uh, 
you have the program to fly with it. He said, Peggy, will you try to hold on to this flag and get it back to the States if you can? And I said that I would. How could they prepare us? There was no precedent for for uh, women nurses uh, being taken prisoner. The nurses were afraid of the Japanese, yet they faced them in army coveralls wearing no military insignia, only their Red Cross armbands. The nurses were left alone with their patients, both American and Japanese, while their shrinking stores of food, water, and medical supplies were cut even more. Then, on June 25th, they were moved out of the tunnel to the topside ruins of Fort Mills Hospital. A week later, the Army nurses were marched to the docks to be taken by boat, then by truck to Manila, there to eventually join the captured Navy nurses held since March at Santo Tomas University, now a Japanese internment center. When the Army nurses came in, they put them in a building that was called Santa Catalina, and they kept them separate from the rest of the attorneys, and also from us. I always felt the Japanese didn't know how to put women in the military, and so they wanted us moved in with the civilian group because a large percentage of that was women and children. Uh, after we were released from Santa Catalina, we were we moved over to Santa Tomas. This was a civilian internment <coughs> camp of about 3,000 people, and uh, we were told that we would sort of help uh, take care of this civilian internees. And when we got to San Tomas and turn the camp, the Japanese put us in one large room and searched all of our belongings. But there were two of them searching the lockers. I had a flag in it. When they saw the flag, they said, um, are they motion? What, what's this? You know, they weren't speaking English, but uh, they were pointing the flag. Only to know what it was. And I pretended that it was a shawl. I just gestured that it was a shawl. And um, well, they still looked concerned and uh, talked to the treatment. Still weren't certain that's what it was, I guess. But uh, I just gestured again that it was a shawl, put it around my shoulders, and they let me keep it. And we worked the entire time while we were interned. The life was pretty monotonous. Um, it was a, a constant struggle from day to day to exist. The food was very scarce. The Japanese allowed only one American Red Cross package to come into the South Boss camp. That contained 48 pounds of food. Uh, some of it was perishable food which we ate right away. In, in Santa Tomas, everybody was always talking about food. You could hardly talk with anyone for even about 10 minutes without the topic of food coming up in a conversation. When I went to bed hungry, I got up hungry. I lost 47 pounds uh, during that time and had quite a bit of trouble with uh, malaria, dysentery, dengue. So uh, we nurses were subject to the same problems uh, as uh, the rest of the prisoners. But it was sad seeing them die. I was sad on the men forward, and uh, I know once we had seven deaths within 28 hours from starvation there toward the last the nurses were hungry for news, as well as for food. Word of the battle for Midway, Guadalcanal, and the Marines in the Gilbert Islands was smuggled into the camp by internees who worked outside the walls and from the camp's hidden radio. Japanese really planned to move all the internees out of the city of Manila. 
Well, after we started, the first thing we thought about was to try to get something to eat. And we could see a chicken outside the barbed wire fence. And the only thing we could think about was to try to get that chicken so we could make some stew, something to eat. But we had a lot of bed bugs that came up to Las Vegas with us because the men had these bahooka beds, the native beds that had little holes in them. And they were just the ideal place for breeding. But the Philippine, we learned the Philippine way of getting rid of them. You put your mattress in the spring outside and put a little sugar up and attract the ants. And the ants went into the little holes and ate the bed bugs, and then you put some scalding water or something or beat the ants off and clean the uh, bed for a while. Conditions worsened in Los Banos and Santo Tomas as already scarce food supplies dwindled even more. I 
think there's not a day goes by that I'm not eternally grateful for all that we have in this great country of ours. And I'm glad that I served in the, uh, in the Navy and served my country in that manner. And it was truly an unusual education. I looked at it as such. It was hard, it was terrible, and many terrible things happened, but uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I would do it all over again. itself and uh, on the right you see all the names of the women and also an acknowledgement of the Filipino nurses who worked with them. And this is what the plaque says. In honor of the valiant American military women who gave so much of themselves in the early days of World War II, they lived on a starvation diet shared the bombing, strafing, sniping, sickness and disease, while working endless hours of heartbreaking duty. They truly earned the name, the Angels of the Town and Corregidor. When the, camp, the end of the campaign for the town came, the nurses <coughs> and the nurses were ordered to Corregidor. Many of them did not want to leave the wounded behind. Despite not knowing what was going to happen to them as women captives of the Japanese, Lieutenant, Chief uh, Nurse, First Lieutenant Josie Nesbitt, requested permission to, retain, to remain on the time with her patients. Her request was denied. Author Elizabeth Norman, who wrote the book We Band of Angels, interviewed many of these nurses later on in life. And she recalled that it wasn't the nurse's own fears or suffering that most haunted them. It was the memory of the night in April 1942 when they received word that the peninsula was about to fail. And they were ordered to leave their patients, just to leave them there on bamboo beds in the middle of the jungle, in the path of an advancing enemy thousands of wounded and bleeding and feverish men, unarmed and utterly helpless. Fifty years later, the nurses wept inconsolably in telling the story. There was a dedication of the plaque um, some 40, 50 years later, I'm not sure of the exact date, and here we see a number of the nurses who came back to Bhutan to attend the dedication of the plaque. Now I'd like to introduce you to Lieutenant Ruth Miller, and she treated patients that from the Battle of the Bulge. Ruth Miller, formerly Ruth Smith, a 22-year-old nurse from Marshalltown, had joined the Army in May of 1943. Then no more we heard about the war. I began to think that maybe it would be a good place to be a mom and do my part. After being commissioned as a second lieutenant, 
Miller was assigned to the 110th Evacuation Hospital and sent to Europe. The 110th's job was to set up near the battlefront, bandage wounded soldiers, and if necessary, perform surgery. After treatment, the soldiers would be transported to hospitals farther from the battle. The 110th went to England in June of 1944. Miller's first assignment was the penicillin team. At the time, penicillin was a new miracle drug that had to be mixed just before use. We just went around every four hours, and if they were sleeping, we had to wake them up. <laughs> and the boy said, we almost rather go back and face the German than you people coming around stabbing us every four hours, but it saved so many lives, and it was good. In one last attempt to get Allied forces out of Europe, Adolf Hitler ordered his army to counterattack in December of 1944. During this last desperate move, the German army pushed 60 miles into Allied territory. The assault became known as the Battle of the Bulge. The name was given to this pivotal encounter because the front line looked like a bulge on battlefield maps. Earlier, during the month of September, the 110th Evacuation Hospital had moved to Luxembourg and set up a field hospital in the town of Esch. Ruth Miller, unaware of the events unfolding nearby, was preparing for a New Year's Eve party along with other nurses from the 110th. As the men were brought in, Miller's belief that her work involved more than just the treatment of physical wounds was reinforced. They were so happy to see somebody from home, from America, and it boosted their morale, and uh, that we were there to take care of them. And I'm sure it made them think of their own girlfriends and wives and mothers too, you know. And uh, it was just really a good feeling to know that you were there to help them out and try and boost their morale because of all what they went through. I just <coughs> suffering was awful. They say war is hell, but I, I say it's devastating, it's cruel, it's, it's terrible. We don't have too much more, but I have a, uh, a short clip about Lieutenant Muriel Engelman, RM. I took this from a very long piece, which was excellent, and she talks about her experience. She was stationed in Liège, Belgium, caring for the casualties from the Battle of the Bulge. The conditions the staff worked under were miserable. The ground was either mud or frozen, and she remembers her feet always wet and waterlogged. For two and a half months, Muriel recalls the sound of constant German buzz bombs that came over every 12 to 15 minutes, 24 hours a day. Every time one was overhead, their hearts would race, wondering if this one had their name on it. <clears throat> At one point, the German advance had gotten within 10 miles of their hospital, and Muriel feared being captured, especially because of the H on her dog tag, which stood for Hebrew. These are the people that Hitler was determined to annihilate. After the barrage of the buzz bombs stopped, uh, the silence became unbearable. They had gotten so used to that sound that they, they couldn't get used to the silence. Um, he said whenever they went to the latrine, they made sure that the sky was clear before they opened the door. Then they'd go in, they'd hurry to finish. He said, you do not want to be caught by a buzz bomb with four layers of pants or down around your ankles. You know, they had the liner, they had the combat pants, they had a liner, they had warm underwear, and finally your panties. When Muriel returned home from the war, she knew that she didn't want to be a nurse in a general hospital anymore because there was no better patient than GI Joe. They never complained, no matter what condition they were in. And here's a very short clip 
of Muriel talking about the GI Joes that she cared for. I'd like to say there was no patient on earth as wonderful as G.I. Joe, the American soldier, because he never complained. He could lie in that rack with pain. If he had never asked for medication, if he saw that we were busy elsewhere in the tent. And then when we got to his bedside, he'd always say, take care of my buddy in the next bed first. And he was grateful for the slightest thing we did for him. He thanked us profusely. And he'd oftentimes grab our hands and kiss them. And uh, he was grateful to be in an American hospital in a bed with a mattress and sheets, items that sometimes he hadn't seen in over a year. And um, he uh, sometimes I'd come on duty uh, in the morning to find a patient curled up foxhole style on the cement floor under his bed. And uh, G.I. Joe was grateful just for us being there, American women he hadn't seen or spoken to sometimes in two or three years. And G.I. Joe was uh, generous and forgiving to the crowds when uh, the POWs would enter the tent to refill a cold bucket or perform some task. Um, he would uh, motion for them to come to his bedside and hold out his pack of cigarettes and indicate that they should help themselves. And as they did so, he'd pull out from under his pillow his precious packet of family photographs and hold them out for the crowd to admire. And he'd say, my mother, my wife, my son, my daughter. And then the crowd would do the same thing. After he returned uh, the, the photograph to the GI, he'd pull out his own photographs and show them to the GI Joe to admire. Here they were, just two human beings, hungry for family and home. Uh, caring for the American soldier was truly a privilege, and it was one of the greatest experiences of my lifetime. Well, G.I. Joe felt the same way about the nurses. This is a tribute from G.I. Joe's printed in the Stars and Stripes, and the Stars and Stripes was a military newspaper that went out to all units. And this reads, to all army nurses overseas, we men were not given the choice of working on the battlefield. We're here because we have to work. You're here because you felt you were needed. When an injured man opens his eyes to see one of you, he can't but be overcome by the thought that you are doing it because you want to. You endure whatever hardships you must to be where you can do us the most good. Just as the troops who survived the war suffered from what is now known as PTSD, <coughs> so did the nurses. Many suffered bouts of depression, alienation, and isolation post-war. As Elizabeth Norman points out in her book, as every veteran of combat and captivity knows, the brutality and loss of war are part of an aura of sadness that follows them to the grave. Yet post-war they carried on. And as one of the last surviving nurses of Bataan stated just before her death, we spent our lives helping people and we did it with honor, and we did it with love, and we never looked back. I think that's a pretty fitting epitaph. Statistics. They received 1,619 medals, citations, and commendations during the war. 16 medals were awarded <coughs> posthumously to women, to nurses who died as a result of enemy fire. And that included the six nurses who died at Anzio, six who died when the hospital ship Comfort was attacked by a Japanese suicide plane, and four flight nurses. Thirteen other flight nurses died in weather-related crashes while on duty. Overall, 201 nurses died while serving in the Army during the war. I was looking for a memorial to nurses who served in World War II, but I couldn't find one. 
Here's the nurse memorial that's at Arlington National Cemetery. Cemetery and That was erected in 1938 and rededicated in 1971, honoring the nurses who served in all of the armed forces. But I found this. This is the Vietnam Nurse Memorial. And I think this statue conveys everything fine that can be said about nurses in all wars. There's so much more that could be said about the bravery and dedication <coughs> of the World War II nurses, but we only have this hour. I brought along three books that I relied on to tell this story. They're excellent, and I recommend them to anyone who'd like to learn more about these gallant women. Thank you for coming. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them if I can. Have questions or comments? Where did you serve? Pardon me? Where did you serve? Well, I did not serve. No, I did not serve. I, I just have always had a fascination with World War II, and also I've been always very um, cognizant about women's issues and wanting to bring them to the fore. And I do believe women have been kind of forgotten in so many ways where they did perform great service. Anyway, after I retired, I'll tell you the story quickly. Um, I retired from healthcare, uh, but I was not a clinician. Um, I decided to go back to school and get a master's in English. I think Penny may have said that. Anyway, when it came time to uh, prepare a thesis, uh, I really was floundering. I couldn't think of anything that I felt that passionate about. And I happened to hear on NPR an author being interviewed by Diane Ream. His name was um, Simon Moore. And uh, he had written a book, it was a fiction book, about women secret agents in World War II. But the book, although it was fiction, it was based on truth. His mother had actually gone to school with one of these uh, secret agents. So that sounded fascinating to me. So I bought the book, I read it, and I, I was more fascinated. I got every book I could from the bibliography. And because I was so you know, engaged, and kind of, it just grabbed me. So I asked my advisor, I said, would I be able to write about these women, maybe looking at it from you know, a gender, whatever point of view. And I, I did look at it from the, bar, the borders that the women crossed. So they said, fine. So I did it, and it was a labor of love. I, you know, I, and then when it was finished, I really hated to leave. I said, felt like these were my women. <laughs> And then a friend of mine suggested that I put together a course and give it at Peconic Landing over on the North Fork. And I did. And then I decided to pursue not just the SOE women, but women power in World War II. And then I developed presentations on the nurses, on Rosie the Riveters, and on fly girls who, who flew during the war, not in combat, but they took the men's places and flew domestically. And so that's what I've been doing, and I love it. <laughs> so that's how I came to it. Have you been to the Women's Monument in Washington? I have not. Yeah. Now, where is that? That's, I mean, what is it? It's a Women's Monument. What is it dedicated? Oh, no, I haven't. And it has um, interactive, I was able to look up my hands service record and World War II, she was an army nurse, and it, it goes through every war and has just beautiful displays and photographs and we have to be <coughs> only for the first woman general oh. from, um, I guess, Caritha III and War is there. I had gone on an honor flight and that was... Oh, an honor flight. flight. Oh, that's so wonderful. One of the yeah. Places. Oh, I have to go. I've been to the, in New Orleans, to the World War II Museum, which is also f phenomenal. Uh, yeah, but I will. I, you know, I didn't know about that. Thank you. What did happen to the men that were left behind, and why were they that? I'm sure they were killed. I'm sure they were killed, because they were wounded. They weren't 
going to take care of the, the Japanese. I, I don't know for sure. I, I guess I could look that up, but uh, I should look that up. How did the timing that relate to the so-called Japan Death Because the men that were able to walk, the soldiers who had surrendered, they walked them out of the town and they died along the way. I think it was 60 miles or something. And they, they have not, no, they were beasts. They were treated so brutally. So many of them died along the way, killed by the Japanese or just falling down, unable to go on any further. We have a lady here whose father was on that death march and he was in prison camp and he survived. <laughs> So, well, anyway, I thank you all very much, and uh, it's just nice to see you. Thank you, Pat. We're so grateful to you for having followed up on this interest of yours and then put together presentations that help us learn a lot. I, I also want to mention that, you know, this library has... In our oral history collection, which Pat has taken a look at, <clears throat> we have quite a few people uh, who've been interviewed over the years, and a number of them talk about World War II. If you go to the Long Island Room or go to the reference desk sometime, when you have, if you have the interest to do this, and just ask to see, we have our interviews, we, we transcribe them, they're in the library, in the room, Southampton Historical Museum has a copy of all of these interviews. There are nurses in World War II, pilots in World War II, life on the home front, and a couple of, of, of just general World War II. Um, many of them were videotaped. I'm not sure that our website has recovered them because something happened, but at some point you could see a bunch of these um, if you were interested. And I was, you know, probably 95% of the people who we've interviewed, 90% are, are no longer living. So I think it's a great resource for this library. And some of these people you would probably know, those of you who live here. Anyway, thank you, Pat, for all you've done for us. And thank you so much for coming. Thank yeah. you. Thank you.